Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to Frontiers of Science. We, um, my name is Deborah Mann. I'm one of the co-chairs of science activities, along with my friend and co-pilot, Judy Webster. Hello. How are you, Judy? Right. There you are. Thank you. Um, Judy and I have been blessed with an extraordinary committee this year, and we have had a lot of fun putting this event together tonight. A few housekeeping notes for this evening. Um, the recording will be accessible through our website. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And Andrew Waterhouse will call on you. And then at that point, if you would go to the upper right corner where it says view and click on speaker so that we will see or actually Andrew will see who is speaking, which will help a lot. Um, two, by the way. Excuse me? Sorry. Oh. Um, and the other thing that I would suggest is that you pace yourselves with the wines because they're only half bottles and we're mm -hmm. going to be here for a while. So <laughs> um, tonight's event is called The Science of Wine Aromas and Oxidation. We have a slate, a big slate of luminaries participating in the event. We have the distinguished Dr. Andrew Waterhouse. He is also known as Andy, but for tonight we have two Andys, so he will be Andrew. Um, he is a faculty advisor at Davis and uh, for the Department of Viticulture and Enology. And he's also the chairman of the Mondavi Institute for Wine and Food Science, for Wine and Food Institute. Anyway, um, Andrew's research focuses on the chemistry of compounds in wine that affect the taste of wine and the health of the consumer. He will be our moderator tonight. And then we will hear from two brilliant scholars. T. Nugent, he's a former ARC scholar. He spent time in the Waterhouse Lab at the Mondavi Institute. And he's a PhD candidate in agricultural and environmental chemistry. T says that he's excited by how sciences like botany, microbiology, and chemistry come together to create art. And then we have Jerry Lynn. He is also a PhD candidate in the horticulture and agronomy graduate group. And he studies in the Cantu lab. Jerry focuses on exploring genetics in grapes, like aroma, phenology, and plant vigor. And he is fascinated by the degree to which small mutations can generate enormous changes that are detectable from the vineyard to the wine glass. From Pay Vineyards, we have Andy Pay, the marketer, we have Nick Pei, the wine grower, and Vanessa Wong, the winemaker. This is definitely a family affair. They will share the complexities of producing wine, the singular characteristics of Pei wines, and their passion for what they do. I would like to say a special thank you to Janet Berry. Janet's not only the Executive Director of Development at UC Davis, in um, student support, but she's a cherished arts member. She was instrumental in connecting the dots tonight. And now I have the distinct privilege of introducing our very special guest, Vice Provost and Dean Jean-Pierre, or, or JP, Del Planck. Um, Dean Del Planck has a PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering. His current focus is to cultivate an inclusive equitable learning environment for graduate students and postdoctoral scholars so that they are equipped to spearhead discoveries with global impact. So Dean Del Planck, if you'll take it from here. Thank you. And um, I'll, I'll apologize first because my puppies decided that it was time to bark. So you may have some background noise. I apologize for that. Um, 
Happy New Year, everyone, uh, and welcome to UC Davis, um, at least virtually. Um, it's actually wonderful to see so many of you on the screen. I, I don't have it in speaker view, so I can get a, a nice perspective of everyone who's there. And it's great to see some of you have already met. Um, of course, I would like to first say thank you to ARCS Northern California chapter for this, their strong partnership uh, in supporting our graduate students who are doing groundbreaking research every day. And you'll find out more about that tonight. Um, as you heard from Deborah, uh, we have an exciting program planned tonight. We will be hearing soon from two of our stellar graduate students uh, doing innovative research, Jerry Lin and T Nguyen. Uh, T is also a former ARC scholar. I, you know, it bears repeating. Um, it is also my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Andy Waterhouse. Um, Andy um, uh, is the current uh, director of the Robert Mondavi Institute for Food and Wine Science. Uh, I had the honor to work alongside uh, Professor Waterhouse when he was serving as Associate Dean of Graduate Programs uh, in Graduate Studies, and I was then the Associate Dean of Graduate Students, so we have history. Uh, Professor Waterhouse uh, joined the Department of Enology and Viticulture um, at UC Davis in 1991. He's uh, internationally recognized in his field. His graduate students and postdocs are winemakers, researchers, uh, professors across California, and in fact, elsewhere around the globe. Um, Again, welcome to all of you. I really hope that next year we can welcome you all in person to our newly built home at the Graduate Center. So if you look behind me on my background, it's actually a very current picture of that Graduate Center. I'll slide a little bit over so you can see more of it, but soon you'll be able to see it in person. And you know, it is so much more fun to enjoy and learn about wine together. So now I'll turn it over uh, the virtual mic uh, to Professor Handy Waterhouse. Evening and thanks JP for that nice introduction. Yes, I did enjoy working with uh, JP a few years ago um, in graduate studies. Um, but I was called away to uh, help out with the Robert Mondavi Institute. Um, I wanted to mention a few things. Um, actually, I want to mention one other thing about JP, by the way, in case you couldn't quite interpret from the uh, I guess the academic lingo, JP is a bona fide rocket scientist. So if you're, <laughs> you wanna know anything about rocket science, uh, JP's the guy. He actually teaches a class on rocket propulsion or something like that. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our program in uh, viticulture and enology. Um, it's uh, one of the older programs at the University of California, in fact, um, it even predates the Davis campus. Um, the, the state told the university that they needed to get busy and organize a program on viticulture and enology and brandy, by the way, back in 1880. So the, the program started in 1880. Um, and by the way, that's the same year that University of Bordeaux established their Institute for Enology. So and when we know most of the people there, of course, so we have this parallel history for, for now well over 100 years. Um, so our program has uh, done various things over the years. And nowadays, we really uh, make sure that we have research and teaching on both, I would say, both sides of the vineyard. So we have vineyard focused research and we have winemaking focused research because you really have to have expertise in both of those areas to make the world's best wine. And that's what we hope our graduates will be doing. Uh, you'll be tasting one of those tonight. Um, so we have research into both, you know, how <clears throat> the grapes grow and everything from the very basic research you'll hear about tonight, which has to do with the genetics of grapevines um, through to practical you know, field uh, practices, you know, how to optimize growth, et cetera, and quality uh, with an established vineyard. And then of course, on the analogy side, we have everything from basic chemistry. We do some of that and T will talk about some of that tonight, um, all the way up to very applied, you know, trials on sorting machines. So a lot of the vineyards nowadays are using sorting machines and we've done experiments on those machines. So we do everything from the basic science through to the very applied 
uh, practical research that 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 winemakers want to know about um, every 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 year. Um, <clears throat> Before we move on to hearing, and we'll start with T talking about some, some wine chemistry. Before we move on to that, I also want to voice my thanks to ARCS for their, their wonderful support for our students here at Davis. Um, as you know, research is complicated and expensive, and uh, there's not always enough money to support both the students and the research. And so your support of students is really instrumental in making sure we have the capacity to move forward. And, uh, and, and, and obviously there's government research funding and so on, but it's not always available for all the things that really need to be done. And sometimes uh, we've discovered that, you know, certain areas of research are not funded by the government. And I would point to enology as a, a particularly notable example is that anything that's really focused on alcohol, alcoholic beverages, the government really shies away from it. So your, your support for that, that research has really been uh, a boon for us. So I'd like to turn to, to T now and T Nguyen, who's uh, finishing up. He's uh, actually been really busy the last few weeks sending out uh, job applications to various schools around California. And we're hopeful he's gonna land one of those jobs. Um, T's been working on wine oxidation starting back in the days when he was a master's student looking at a microox, which is a common winemaking practice. And we were trying to figure out how to manage that better. Um, and he did actually uh, help move the ball down the court on that. But when he moved into his PhD project, he really wanted to focus more on basic, the basic uh, chemical reactions that uh, constitute you know, wine oxidation. And, He's been focused on, uh, well, I think I should just stop and turn it over and let him tell you what he's been working on. So T, take it away. All right, um, thanks Andy for that introduction and thank you everyone for attending this evening. Let me pull up in my slides here. Alrighty, so yeah, um, I work for Dr. Andy Waterhouse and in the Department of Viticulture and Enology, and I study wine oxidation. So this is the chemistry underlying wine aging. Um, now I do want to start with this, this idea that acidity increases aging potential. Now I'm sure like the wine connoisseurs among you have heard some version of this, right? That, that high acid wines last longer or they age more gracefully, something along those lines. Um, and my research at the moment um, seeks to answer the question, like, is there any chemical basis for this? I'm not going to call it a misconception, but this conception, right? Um, is there scientific evidence for this idea? Um, now, before we get into that, though, I just want to talk about what oxidation is. So in the context of wine, um, oxidation is a cascade of chemical reactions. So it's not just one reaction, but it's, it's a vast, complex network of chemical reactions that are triggered by oxygen. And these chemical reactions change wine's color, flavor, and mouthfeel over time, right? That's, that's what wine aging is. Um, now, speaking from a purely chemical perspective, though, oxidation is the loss of electrons, electrons being tiny negative particles on atoms and molecules and whatnot. Now, oxidation is complementary to reduction. So if oxidation is the loss of electrons, reduction is the gain of electrons. These two processes have to, have to happen together. So if you have oxidation, you also have to have reduction. If atoms or molecules are losing electrons, those electrons have to be gained by other molecules. And that's, that's what most chemical reactions are. It's a transfer of electrons. Now, the thing that causes oxidation most of the time is oxygen, right? That, that makes sense. Um, oxygen is causing the loss of electrons. Now, what's interesting is that oxygen can't react, cannot react directly with organic compounds. Like if oxygen were to react with organic compounds spontaneously, like all life on earth would just burst into flames or, or something like that. Don't, don't quote me on that, but like it doesn't happen, right? Oxygen doesn't react directly with organic compounds. So there has to be a catalyst, some, some sort of liaison or conduit between oxygen and organic compounds. And in wine, that's iron. It's the same thing in our bodies. Like when we breathe, when we breathe oxygen, it's the iron in our blood that's reacting with oxygen, right? So same thing in wine. 
So here is um, just a schematic of the mechanism of wine oxidation. Um, on the left, we have the organic compounds. On the right, we have oxygen. And in the middle, we have iron. Okay. So these organic compounds in wine um, that I'm showing here are phenols, or you might also hear them called polyphenols or phenolic compounds. Now, these are major contributors to wine's color, flavor, and mouthfeel. And when they oxidize, they turn into quinones. And these quinones then go on in secondary reactions, and that's, that's the cascade of chemical reactions that happens over time. And that'll change wine's color, flavor, and mouthfeel. Um, then on the right, we have oxygen. Right? If phenols are being oxidized, um, oxygen has to be reduced. So oxygen is taking those electrons from these phenols. And oxygen is reduced into hydrogen peroxide. And this is the same peroxide that you get at CVS or Rite Aid or wherever you buy your peroxide. And this peroxide, like the quinones, will also participate in further reactions down the cascade. And in the middle, linking, linking the two, is um, iron. So iron catalyzes this, uh, this redox reaction between oxygen and phenols. It's the go-between. And it does this by cycling between two different species of iron. So there's iron two and iron three. Now these, these are different by one electron. That's the difference between iron two and iron three. So you can think of it this way. Iron basically acts as a shuttle carrying electrons one at a time from phenols to oxygen, phenols to oxygen. Or I also like to think of it as like this revolving door or a turnstile for electrons. It's, it's carrying electrons from phenols to oxygen. Now, where does acidity play into all this, right? What, how does um, acidity affect this process? So the acids in wine um, form complexes with iron. So the acids in wine will include tartaric acid, malic acid, lactic acid, acetic acid. All of these will form complexes with iron. So what I've shown here is a complex between iron and tartaric acid. So you can see the iron atoms in the middle, and then around it are the acid molecules. So these complexes control the redox cycling of iron. Um, if, if we think of iron again as that wheel, these acids are sort of like the grease or the lubricant that keeps that wheel spinning, okay? And this complexation is pH dependent. Um, so at lower pH, that's at more acidic conditions, there's less complexation. Then at higher pH, more basic conditions, there's more complexation. So what effect does this have on wine oxidation. Um, so here is some data from a much larger project, but here's just some of the data. Um, so what I did here was I made some model wines, which are just like fake synthetic wines for the sake of experimentation. So it's got some water, some ethanol, and some acid in it. And I made these wines at three different pHs, pH 3, pH 3.5, and pH 4. So this is the, the range of typical wine pH. Wines are typically somewhere between 3 and 4 pH. And then what I did is I saturated them with air, so I brought the oxygen levels to maximum capacity. That's about seven or eight milligrams per liter. So you can see that's the top of my y-axis there. And then I watched these three model wines at three different pHs consume that oxygen over time. And you can see that at pH 4, the oxygen is consumed quickly. pH 3.5, a little bit slower, and it's even slower at pH 3. So the rate of oxygen consumption decreases as pH decreases. So in other words, in more acidic conditions, oxygen is being used, it's being processed more slowly. So it does appear to, there does appear to be some, some credence to the idea that acidity improves aging potential. Um, and I do, I do just wanna share this visual illustration of what was going on in the experiment. So here I have the three different model wines illustrated as these three different um, funnels and they have different size tips. Okay, so pH three, small tip, pH 3.5 in the middle and pH four with a big outlet. And what I did was I saturated these wines with oxygen and I watched the oxygen being consumed over time. So you'll see that pH four, it's fast, pH 3.5 medium and then pH three slow, right? So I'm letting these wines consume that oxygen. And so there does appear to be an effect of acidity on oxidation. Right, But there is an issue with this, this experiment. And that issue is we never do this to wine. We never saturate a wine with oxygen and let it go, right? So saturation is about eight milligrams per liter of oxygen. But during the winemaking process, when wine is like out in the open in the winery, it hits maybe two milligrams per liter of oxygen. 
And that's a quarter of saturation. And then in the barrel or in the bottle, it's only at like 0.1 milligrams per liter of oxygen. So that's, that's almost two orders of magnitude less than in the experiment. So really what's going on during one aging is it, it's a slow drip of oxygen, illustrated like so. So if, if it's a slow drip of oxygen, the question is, does acidity still even matter at that point? If, if we're never really operating at maximum capacity, does acidity still matter? And that's something that I'm researching at the moment. I don't have any more data yet. Um, but I will say this, uh, different wines under the same conditions of the slow drip of oxygen, they're going to develop differently, right? Presumably because of their chemical composition, perhaps due to their acidity. So there, there is difference, acidity is having an effect, but it must not be having an effect at this level. There must be something downstream in the cascade that is, that is being controlled. There's another control point down the, the cascade of chemical reactions that um, I'm interested in pursuing further research into. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. And of course, thank you for the ARCS Foundation for um, supporting this research. Back to Andy. <laughs> thank you, T. Um, now, Deborah, did we want to ask for questions now? Yes. You're driving, so. <laughs> OK. Well, before everyone forgets yeah. <laughs> what T was talking about, let's see if we have any questions. So. Yeah. Good idea. Uh, you can raise your hand. I don't, I'm not sure how to manage this. Turn off your mute and just start talking. Or use the chat room. Uh, I or, see Jerry there. Yeah, right. Is there a different impact between wines that are red and white by this process, by the acidic process that we're talking about? Does the color um, of the wine impact the acidic procedure very much at all? Um, not so much. Wine, white wines typically have a lower pH, so they're typically more, a little bit more acidic than red wines, but there is a lot of overlap between their pHs. So, um, but you anticipate red wines lasting longer usually than whites, right? Living longer. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the, um, I think the reason that red wines last longer doesn't necessarily have to do with acidity. It has to do with the phenolic compounds in, in red wine. Yeah. Thank you. So, so um, there's, a, there's a question here. Uh, as a consumer, why should I be concerned great. about oxidation? So the ultimate goal of this research would be to have some measure of aging potential or like to be able to predict wine aging. So with that information, either the winemaker or the consumer would have some idea of the shelf life of wine. Um, or even ideally, maybe sometime down the line, we'd have um, like recommendations in the bottle, like age for this many years or something like that. Yeah. I heard somebody was trying to ask a question. I think I was trying to read them to you to make it easier, but you're, uh, you've got it. Okay, so there's an, another question about um, the bottle closure. Um, I, they ask is uh, cork versus screw cap, and I, I guess I can answer that one. So T hasn't worked on on closures, but we have done research on that, and um, they, it does make a difference. Uh, one of the big differences is that screw caps and synthetic corks, uh, including um, well, anyway, tech, what are called technical corks are more reproducible. In other words, the amount of oxygen that gets into the bottle is more consistent uh, with those manufactured closures. Um, but I'll, I'll just, for this group, I'll just uh, emphasize a couple of things. Um, these days, um, well, you, in other words, you can't tell as a consumer what kind of closure, I mean, you can tell if obviously it's screw cap or not. But beyond that, you, you really have no way of knowing how that closure is going to perform. So for instance, there's some screw caps that let in about the same amount of oxygen as a natural cork, and there's others that let in much less. And there's no way you're, you're told that as a consumer. So you really don't know what you're getting. 
as a closure um, on the bottle. Now, the other thing I think this group should be aware of is that natural cork, <clears throat> of course, we all know it has an issue with cork taint. Uh, these days, the, the corks are being tested, every single one of them, for the high-end wines. So they're, they're very close to eliminating that problem. Um, you could ask whoever you're buying wine from, did they test their corks? They, they might actually be able to tell you that. But what's key is that natural cork actually changes its behavior with time during aging. So one of the things that's important is that early on when a, when a red, red wine is being aged, and this is very specific to red wines, you want some oxygen coming into the wine because that helps color and flavor development. But after a you know, whatever, five to 10 years, you really don't want that to continue. If it continued at that rate, then the wine wouldn't last decades. But natural cork actually changes uh, because, and, and I'm sure you've seen this on older corks, the cork actually absorbs some wine into the cork itself. And that actually changes how much oxygen gets into the bottle. So on an older cork, the amount of oxygen coming in is actually decreased by 90%. Um, on, a, on a 10 year old cork, the amount of oxygen coming in is only 10% of a new cork. And therefore that, that bottle now is preserved with much less oxygen for another 10 or 20 years. Um, and it, it, it remains low basically until the cork stops properly sealing and if you've seen very old bottles, you would see leak, leaks and drips. And that's because the cork has broken down so much that it's no longer properly sealing and some wine starts to leak out. And, and that certainly means it's time to recork. Um, now, of course, if you have a, oh, a 61 Mouton, you know, recorking becomes a real tricky financial and political decision but I don't, want, I don't have time to get into that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, closures are, are a very interesting uh, uh, area to which, which consumers can relate to, I think. All right, um, let's see. What's the best way to preserve an open bottle of wine? Uh, <laughs> I would recommend drinking the wine myself, but um, if that's not feasible, then uh, actually, Closing it uh, with the cork or perhaps uh, some other closure and putting it in the fridge is the best way as con the consumer has to actually preserve uh, some sort of freshness. Um, but uh, I wouldn't recommend waiting too many days. Um, white wines actually usually do a little bit better um, over a couple of days than red wines. And I'm not gonna go into the chemistry on that. Let's see, let me... Um, let me open it up and see if there's any other questions before we move on to Jerry. Anyone want to speak up? I don't think this is a bashful group. What about what is the sorting machine? Uh, let's see. Does Vanessa want to talk about a sorting machine? I guess I could feel that that um, it's not pertaining to T's uh, research, but you had brought it up about uh, the different research that you do at UC Davis. The sorting machine is um, an electronic and mechanical thing to help replace what um, we do by hand is to physically view grapes as they are incoming into the winery and sort them like a triage where you take out things that are undesirable and there are machines that have been developed to um, be able to aid the human eye and the human hands to do it more efficiently um, robotically um, using electronic eyes and um, what are the air air propelled compressed air. yeah compressed air and um and there's everything from just like a, a conveyor belt, which you stand over, or things that have a sh shaking mechanism to let small particles drop through various screens to optical um, 
eyes and, and things like that. So that's what a sorting machine is, briefly. <laughs> I have a question for T. Can I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, T. Um, so I love the funnels with the various openings. Um, I wondered in your experimental design, did you consider all of the times in the winemaking process through Elevage before up to bottling where there were exposures to ample oxygen? And I'm thinking of topping. Let's say you have a topping regime every two weeks. When we look at oxygen uptake through the staves of the barrels, they found that by far the biggest oxygen intrusion comes when you take the bung out. Um, mm -hmm. So if you had a higher pH wine, that is a less acidic wine, every time you did anything, you net would have much more oxidation starting at that top level, and then there would be a trickle down. Is that considered in your experimental design? Um, no, no, I did not consider that. That is a good point. Um, <laughs> read that, like, during the winemaking process, it never really goes above two milligrams per liter. You're never saturating a wine with, with oxygen. Not all of the wine, yeah, but let's say you're pressing the juice. Well, and it's going to be fermented, and that's going to strip all the oxygen out. But OK, but still, there are things that were oxidized that otherwise would still be in there afterwards. So when you have the juice falling into a, a, a juice pan that's, you know, um, 12 feet by six feet, you know, that's quite a surface area, you mm -hmm. know, uh, or in a, in a half full tank. There, there are measures that we take once the wine is finished where we're really trying to prevent any oxygen uptake whatsoever, but inevitably, and I'd say topping is the one that really comes to mind because of that research, but. I'll, I'll have to think about it some more in the future for future projects. All right. We can uh, have another Zoom. <laughs> there's more questions, but I think we need to move on. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jerry. So Jerry is a research graduate student with Dario Cantu, Professor Dario Cantu. And, and Jerry's sort of a plant guy. You might be able to tell from his Zoom room that he's got a few plants there. His Instagram feed, by the way, is, is a is just a list of all these plants he runs across in Davis or outside of town. Um, and uh, he's working on a very interesting project. Um, the, about 20 years ago, actually, Professor Walker, who's now about, about ready to retire, uh, did a cross of Cabernet and Riesling. And this is a very unusual cross because these grapes come from completely different regions of the world. And, and no one, I think, well, uh, grape breeders cross everything, but no one would have thought to cross those two. But it was quite fortuitous because those two grapes have very different backgrounds. In other words, you have very different flavor profiles. One is red, one is ripe, et cetera. So um, a couple of years ago, we were able to get the, those plants, the original crosses, and get them propagated out into some vineyards in Davis and in Napa. And Jerry's got a project now looking at what I guess we call progeny, right, Jerry? And he'll tell us about this very interesting experiment. Jerry. Thank you for that introduction. Um, All right, so um, as Dr. Waterhouse was saying, I, uh, I'm a fourth year PhD student in horticulture and agronomy. Um, before that, I did my master's in viticulture and enology at Davis, and I've been with uh, Professor Kantu since then, um, working on grapes and grape genetics. So I'll go over a little bit of the background, um, explain the experiment um, and the main objectives and show a little bit of the uh, data we have so far. So what we perceive as aroma is um, basically our brain's interpretation of um, signals 
produced when volatile compounds bind to receptors in our nose. And um, in, for wine, those volatile compounds come from the grape or from uh, the fermentation microbes and aging processes. And um, there's a few factors that affect uh, the grape and wine aroma. And the first and uh, foremost is the variety or cultivar. Um, I'll use those two words interchangeably uh, for this presentation. And then um, followed by the climate where you grow that variety. And then the viticultural practices. So how you grow it, um, what sort of uh, training you do, um, how you manage the, uh, the, the canopy, and then the pests and diseases. So um, the picture in the upper left, uh, that's a, a virus that can affect the ripening of grapes and affect the flavor. Uh, and then find after you, you, you pick the fruit, um, the, how you, what microbes you use during fermentation can affect the flavor there as well. Um, so what strain of yeast you use, whether or not you go through malolactic fermentation, and then also your winemaking practices, how you age the wine, how long you ferment, um, your skin contact. Uh, so for the first four factors, um, well, as a plant breeder, like I like to think of these. Um, so the first one is the genetic component um, of the overall phenotype. So that's the phenotype being the, the wine aroma. And then climate viticultural practices, pests and diseases are uh, environmental factors. And so the, uh, we know quite a bit about the uh, actual aroma compounds that are found in grapes and wine. Um, and I've shown some of the major compound classes on this table here, uh, organized by the biosynthetic pathway, so how they're made in the plant. Um, and I show a representative compound, a descriptor, so like what that compound smells like in wine. And then a, an example cultivar where that uh, compound is really important in its aroma. And so we know quite a bit about the compounds and we know a little bit about how they're produced, uh, but the, uh, the genetic side of that is pretty, um, is still pretty unknown um, with a few exceptions. So for example, uh, this first one, linalool is, um, it smells like, la like flowers, lavender, um, coriander seed. And that's a really important compound in the aroma of muscat. Um, so like um, Moscato, stuff like that. And that's due to a single uh, amino acid change in a gene. So just one base pair change in the uh, genome of this grape uh, causes it to produce a lot of uh, monotropines. And then uh, a characteristic uh, aroma of Syrah, of wine made from Syrah is black pepper. That is a compound um, called rotundum. And this is produced by a gene that is only found in Syrah and a few other uh, varieties and is absent in, in other grapes. And then for uh, uh, Cabernet Franc and other uh, Bordeaux varieties, they're often known for their um, green bell pepper aroma. And uh, that's caused by a gene that is, um, is found in almost all grapes, but is only uh, active in the fruit of uh, these, these varieties from this from this area. And so like um, all this goes uh, towards uh, my research question, which is how do genetic factors contribute to differences in aroma between cultivars? And to answer that question, I'm working with um, this uh, Riesling by Cabernet Sauvignon population that Dr. Waterhouse was talking about. And that uh, I think was, was done in 1994, uh, consists right now of 138 uh, individuals, so 138 siblings. Um, and uh, so, yeah, like these two uh, parents were chosen partially because they are both important to uh, wine grape varieties, um, but also because they are so different. Um, and for example, uh, Riesling has a lot of monoterpenes. Again, that's the uh, floor, these compounds that, that contribute a floral character to wine. Um, whereas those are very low or absent in Cabernet. And Cabernet has a lot of the bell peppery methoxypyrazines, which Riesling does not. And there's another compound called TDN that Riesling is very well known for, and that's a, sort of a, 
diesel-y, petrol-y smell that is also absent in Cabernet. And so um, the, uh, the, the research vineyard is at uh, Oakville Research Station in Napa. And uh, we grafted nine plants of each genotype for a total of about 1,260 vines. Um, this was a picture of, uh, taken last spring in their third growing season. And so this year uh, is the first year we'll be getting a fairly full crop from, from most of these vines. And so the main objective of this project is to identify genetic bases of um, phenotypic traits of, of interest in this population. So not just aroma, but also traits that are important uh, for viticulture. And so first I'm documenting this variation in the population and then um, using that variation uh, to calculate or to associate uh, genetic regions um, mm -hmm. with these traits. And uh, once we've identified, sort of narrowed down the um, regions in the genome where, uh, that, that are related to these traits, we can then go and identify specific um, genes or um, expression patterns that are related to this variation in the traits. And so why is this so important? Uh, well, the, um, it's, uh, we, we understand the environmental factors that affect uh, grape and wine aroma pretty well, but so far we don't know how those interact with the genetic side of things. And um, as you probably know, last fall or last summer and fall in California, we had some pretty massive fires. And uh, uh, what comes along with fire is uh, something called smoke taint. Uh, which is where the grapes actually pick up volatile compounds from the smoke and that can persist in the fruit and then later on um, be detected in the wine and that can be pretty unpleasant. But um, understanding, like if we can find out uh, what genes or what genetic markers might be related to a certain cultivar's um, resistance or susceptibility to smoke taint, we can use that to, to guide or to, to make decisions on what varieties to plant in say an area that's very prone to fire. And it's also important um, to, uh, for the breeding of new grape varieties. Um, so uh, when you grow grapes from seed, uh, that takes, it can take anywhere from one to three or four years before you can uh, evaluate the fruit. So um, with this, uh, with uh, projects like this, where we can identify genetic markers that are associated with a trait that we that we want in um, in a variety in in what we're trying to breed for, uh, we can screen the seedlings while they're still young and not have to wait for them to fruit before we can uh, eliminate the ones that are not going to have that trait. And third is novel flavors. So. Um, Combining different genetic backgrounds can give you a uh, brand new combinations of flavors that you haven't like that you, you don't see in, in most grapes. And so, if you've had the cotton candy grapes, um, that's actually uh, they have this really in, interesting, intense flavor, and that's not found in most other grapes. And that's still that's just due to um, just the breeding between um, an American grape and the uh, of the uh, European uh, wine or the species we use for, for, for most of our fruit. And uh, so that combination resulted in something that, that had this brand new flavor. And that's something that can be explored in wine grapes as well. So uh, just a little bit of preliminary data from this population. Um, so right now we've already seen this huge variation in phenology and that's the uh, the, the stages of development uh, throughout the year. So from bud break, uh, when the plants break dormancy, uh, to flowering and to when the fruits ripen. So within this population, we've seen um, some plants will break dormancy a full month before the others. And then in the pictures here, this was all taken on the same day last May. And you can see that these three different uh, siblings, they, they're completely different stages of flowering. And so, 
like some are almost done flowering while others are still um, developing their flowers. And the same goes for the ripening as well. And there's also a lot of uh, variation in leaf morphology. Some look like the parents, some don't, some don't look like either parent at all. And then what's uh, probably most interesting for everyone is the uh, fruit diversity. And so there's a lot of uh, variation in the um, cluster architecture. So the, how the, each cluster looks, uh, for example, we have huge differences in size uh, between siblings, uh, between cluster density. So how tightly packed those berries are within each cluster and that can have um, uh, consequences for disease susceptibility. Uh, how big the berries are, and this can um, this can be important in wine making. And here's just a, a collage of some of the different uh, uh, the different progeny and how they look compared to the parents. And so. This is all just the visual differences, um, but what I'm really interested in is the metabolite diversity. And so what, that's what I'm working on uh, this year, or right now actually. And um, so for that, we collected fruit last year and froze it. And now we're gonna be analyzing the volatile profile. And from there, um, because the, the population is, the two parents are all wine grapes and uh, the winemaking process also affects um, the aroma we're gonna be making wine this year and then analyzing the volatile profile of that. And then uh, ultimately conducting a, a descriptive analysis where we have people um, basically come and uh, um, evaluate the wines um, for uh, sensory characteristics. And then we'll see if we can identify uh, um, associate genetic regions with wine characters. And uh, that's it for now. Um, lots of things ahead. Thank you for listening. Great. This was. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. All right. Clap, clap, clap. I, it's really odd to do this with no feedback, I think. <laughs> Nice okay. presentation, Jerry. Jill, did you want to ask a question? No, I, I was saying how strange it is not to have feedback or something in this. It would, Jerry's presentation was lovely and we can't all clap and say thank you. And <laughs> very, very interesting. Thank you. Chris, for Chris Forbes has a few questions. Um, Andrew, so can you um, can you address? She has a question about the Coravin. Um, well, let me let me get to the Coravin later. Okay. Let me, let's let's try to address some questions to Jerry. Okay. Um, Last question to Jerry there, talking yeah. about uh, so, what reviewers. Yeah. So uh, if a wine reviewer says that the wine has certain flavors. Can you actually measure that? So uh, part of the reason why we're doing a sensory uh, study as well is because um, what you see in their chemical profile is usually correlated, but doesn't necessarily correspond um, with how a consumer perceives that wine. So um, just because you have a high level of some compound that smells like Roses doesn't mean that the wine will have like an intense rose character. Um, and everybody interprets smells differently. Everybody has a uh, different uh, sensitivity to, to, to aroma compounds. So um, it's really difficult to just to, to like um, directly uh, correlate the two. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make a general comment to underscore the importance of this work. Um, we recently had a program on climate change and viticulture and one of the issues is how, to, how are we gonna be able to maintain, for instance, high quality wine production and 
specific regions, say like in uh, Oakville, where we have a vineyard, when the climate changes so much that maybe the, the varieties we have now won't perform the same. And so one of the options is to come up with new varieties that are gonna work well under the new conditions. And it, it traditionally it takes forever, literally, to come up with new grape varieties. Um, so the technology that Jerry's developing is, will speed up the process quite a bit. Um, so it's gonna be very important down the road to be able to do these genetic tests uh, as a part of a breeding process uh, and figure out how to make varieties that we want to drink, uh, but still grow well in, in specific places. Um, let's see, I, I think we're gonna, are there any other questions for Jerry? I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, I have one. Jerry, are, is, are your studies now postdoc? Are you now, you're getting, you have a PhD already. No, not, not yet. I'm still, oh, I'm in my okay. fourth year. Yeah. Okay. You, you know, um, I just want to say that I'm getting a few texts. Uh, some people have not started drinking yet, <laughs> and they're <laughs> they're staring at their wine bottles. So I just um, don't want to run out of time. <laughs> We've started drinking, Deborah. Okay. You'll, you'll be happy now. We've started here. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. I've started. Um, I started on the white. The, the Chardonnay. Yeah. So are we going to get to hear about these wines? Because the Chardonnay is delicious. Yeah, it's, we are. Jerry, um, so did you say 38 different progeny? 138. 138. Oh my goodness. What a, what a huge experiment. And then that's a single plant. And, and I'm, what I'm leading up to is, will you have enough clusters to make wine from each different one? And so, then can you do that at scale so that it's actually representative of what a, you know, a commercial wine will be? Those are the challenges, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we, we propagated nine plants of each, um, each progeny. So 1260 total. Um, wow. And uh, Theoretically, that should give us enough fruit for about enough to do a sensory study. Um, about, I think, around 10 gallons or so, um, or less. Um, but there are some some of individuals that have clusters that are like this big, and uh, those those are never going to produce enough to 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 be in, to to be anything more than just like research interest. Um, and and just given the 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 feasibility of making uh, wine and what we have, like uh, we're going to be using the um, the metabolite profile uh, to guide our decisions on which of the the progeny we're going to make wine from. Well, let's let's move on. I want to hand this over to the Pays and Vanessa. Uh, so that everyone will feel more comfortable tasting the wine. So <laughs> is it is it Andy that starts? Sure, I'll take it. All right. All right, Thank so you. yes, I, I, I want to encourage you all to uh, start drinking heartily. Um, we have about uh, 35 minutes for you to drink a bottle and a half, but I know you can do it. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I want to show you a few things. I'm Andy Pei, and Nick Pei and, uh, and Vanessa Wong are also uh, on the call. And we're all going to talk a little bit about Pei. But I'm just going to share a screen uh, real quickly, uh, just kind of give you an overview of who we are. But while I'm doing this, please drink um, so that uh, uh, hopefully you'll be more receptive. So uh, hopefully on your screen, you see a, uh, a picture of the vineyard and some fog. Uh, give me a thumbs up, Deborah, if you see it. So I'm sure it's working. All right, super. Um, so real quick, pay vineyards. Uh, Nick, uh, I'm the guy with the beard and Vanessa up front. Obviously, this is an older photo. There's no reason to update them when you looked much better when you were 15 years younger. Um, 
we're at a state winery, which means we grow our own fruit. Uh, and uh, we're pioneers in a, the, a region that's soon to get their uh, new AVA called the West Sonoma Coast. But uh, for now, it's the Sonoma Coast, which is the coast of Sonoma County, along the Pacific Ocean. Um, and uh, we have a couple of Davis grads here. Uh, Vanessa, undergrad, BS in analogy. My brother went and got, uh, took classes for his master's at Davis. And then I, I'm the one who has zero uh, chemistry uh, knowledge. So I'm going to say a lot of things that are going to be inaccurate. And uh, all of you can correct me. Um, but uh, before we uh, get more into pay, I want to kind of uh, orient you uh, for those of you who are not familiar with um, with where uh, where the Sonoma Coast is. Okay, I got to stop my share and make this work. And I guess it must be this one. Yes, there we go. Okay, so uh, you should be looking at the western half of the United States, and uh, you can see that big old bread basket there, and Davis is somewhere around here, and. Uh, I'm going to zoom in and take you into San Francisco, which for those of you out on the West Coast, this is old hat. And I'm going to take you north up the coast. And one of the neat things about Google Earth is uh, I want to stop that as I did that. As I'm going north, follow that line right there. That's the San Andreas Fault. And so that fault line runs along the coast, uh, creates uh, Tamales Bay, Bodega Bay, jumps back into the water here. You can see right here. And then jumps back on the land. And the San Andreas Fault, uh, we'll get into a little bit of geology for a second, but uh, that's really important uh, for our geology where we are. And we're in a place named Annapolis, uh, not to be mistaken with Maryland. Uh, once upon a time, I don't know, maybe a thousand people lived there, but now it's, it's down in the, the low hundreds. Um, and that is where my, uh, my brother and I, back in uh, the mid nineties, uh, we were looking around for a piece of land, uh, and that's where we ended up finding an old sheep ranch and apple orchard. So uh, that's my quick orientation for uh, for where Pay Vineyards is located. And uh, then I'll jump back to tell you a little bit about us. So um, now you should, you should see a map of California and its AVAs uh, in Northern California in Sonoma. And uh, that little red star uh, that's Annapolis, that's where we are. And you can see the San Andreas Fault going there. And we're way up here in this corner. We were the first folks uh, to go up there uh, that far in the Northwest corner uh, in the mid nineties. And we went there because we were looking to make a certain style of wine. This is just a map showing you what the West Sonoma Coast AVA is gonna be. Um, and one of the things that my brother uh, will, will chime in in a second here, We'll tell you all about uh, is that uh, the reason we went out there was that he had a theory about uh, what uh, what factors were important to make a certain style of wine. And one of the things we were looking for uh, were cool temperatures, but we we're also looking for certain type of soil. And uh, this is my quick uh, geology lesson, which uh, I hope not to fumble too badly. But uh, the San Andreas Fault is where the uh, Pacific and the North American plates. Uh, came to contact and, the, and uh, the subduction of the Farallon and the Pacific plate under the North American plate and uh, scraped up these marine soils and drained these inland seas and created this coastal ridge that we're on. Um, and uh, you can see here the San Andreas Fault and the little river that goes out to the ocean. And we're up on a, this uh, drained inland sea and it's fairly steep. You can see from the, the tractor that Nick is driving, it, it's a pretty steep hills. Um, and we're about six to 700 feet elevation. And uh, that is, it turns out, extremely important. Um, oh yeah, there are scallop and nautilus fossils uh, in our soils. So old marine soils, there's our, there's our we have proof of that. Um, but uh, what's important about uh, our location is that not only are uh, we at 600, 700 feet elevation, but we're about three and a half, four miles from the ocean, which puts us in what they call an inversion layer. Uh, and that inversion layer, uh, I'm going to hand over to Nick so he can talk a little bit about the inversion layer and why that's important. And, uh, and we'll get into you know, how that affects uh, our climate, 
temperatures, precipitation, humidity, et cetera. So Nick, go ahead. Yeah, so um, the Pacific Ocean is cold, especially right near the coast. There's something called upwelling that's going on, bringing cold water from deeper depths uh, up to the surface. Our dominant weather pattern is west-east. Um, air uh, is uh, cooled by the cold water as it comes close to the uh, land mass of the coast of California. And the fact of the matter is the air is colder close to the water and it gets warmer as you go up, which is the opposite of the way it is uh, over land masses. The uh, radiative effect of land is always heating the air so the warmest air is closest to the Earth's surface and then gets cooler as you go up. And you can think about when you climb a mountain, you should always bring a windbreaker because it's uh, colder up top. So for an inversion layer, it actually gets warmer up until a point, and that's what we call the top of the inversion layer. And then thereafter, as you continue up, it reverts and starts to get colder again. So this effect, this inversion layer caused by this cold ocean water um, averages about a thousand feet. Of course, it varies, it's, it's weather dependent, um, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. And being that we're from 600 to 800 foot elevation, we're more often in the inversion layer. And now, so um, that means the air has been chilled. And if we were too close to the ocean and too low elevation, it might be too cold to grow grapes. And of course, if we're out of the inversion layer and there are some vineyards in our neighborhood or kind of our neighborhood that are, they're just ever so slightly warmer, that many more days of uh, hours per day or total hours of the growing season above a uh, certain temperature. So uh, yeah, that, that's, that's what the, uh, the fog and that water and that's, uh, why is that important? Do you want me to go into that, Andy? Oh, you're muted. Um, we're gonna get to that right here. Okay, all right. So um, yeah, so, so where we are, the, the Pacific Ocean being, you know, 53-ish degrees, uh, the water year round uh, doesn't really heat up because of, uh, of, of where that, that water is coming from. So our weather is pretty moderate right up on the coast. As long as you're in that inversion layer, your weather is coming on shore, you don't get those huge heat spikes. You don't get frost, for example, in the winter, um, which means that our temperatures are you know really topping out in the low 70s, unless we're having an offshore or something like that, but usually kind of in the 60s, low 70s, which is pretty cold for grape growing. Um, and we feel like this is an, an ideal uh, situation um, because it leads to wines that don't accumulate uh, as much sugar uh, in a short period of time. It takes longer for that sugar to accumulate, which is what ferments in primary fermentation to make alcohol. And uh, if you, you have a lot of sugar, you have too much alcohol, that can take a wine out of balance. It's like having a shot of alcohol, you get that burn in the back. You don't really want that in wine. Uh, we have a longer uh, ripening and you heard, uh, uh, I think Jerry was talking about uh, phenols and uh, the importance of those compounds. Um, and, you know, longer hang time, you'll have more uh, phenolic development in the skins. And we can retain our acidity, which, uh, whether or not it's true, I feel like it affects aging uh, positively. Uh, and our wines do uh, respire less uh, acid because uh, it's cooler and, and, and cooler uh, it tends to stay in the grapes. And so we have quite low pHs, uh, relatively speaking, uh, in our wines. And we think that that's very beneficial for, for uh, enjoying it with food and also just getting freshness and brightness. And so we think there's a real harmony among the type of wines we can make. As you're drinking these wines, especially the red wines, I think you'll see a harmony between fruit, floral, and earth aromas. And some people start, some people talk about, they go, oh, California makes big fruity wines or, you know, Burgundy makes earthy wines. And well, I think really, you know, sure there are Burgundian wines that are earthy, but there's also Burgundian wines that are floral and fruity and mm -hmm. same for California. And you can have all those things. And I think what we're looking for is a harmony among those different aromas. Um, and uh, we think that, that that makes a difference. So Nick, if you wanna um, go real quickly into some of your farming, uh, we, we think that this is, you know, it all starts there, but I'll kind of let Nick take that. So I came of age professionally uh, as, Viticulturalists were getting their brains wrapped around vertical shoot positioning. So you can see these uh, canopies are like vertical walls. 
And the point is that, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, the fruit underneath the canopy so that in the middle of the day, the strongest sun is blocked by the canopy. Um, you do want sunlight to touch the berries. Um, that's important for flavor development, but um, you want the sun not to be hot. So in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, or let's say, you know, those times other than the middle of the day, uh, depending on which way the row is oriented, you, you know, you have vertical shoot development. So I did not um, absorb the romance of the old world that said that you need to plant them uh, together like a bonsai garden, uh, meter by meter. There is merit to that argument. There is uh, uh, more competition. Um, but I will tell you that um, uh, you, it's not all that easy to find the equipment to farm uh, that, those types of plots. And it is also um, difficult to um, farm those kinds of systems on a slope and we are on a hill and you know uh, I, I, not to say I haven't been to some trade shows and seen them, some amazing machines um, this is just where we came of age in our uh, viticultural learning so the spacing is uh, about uh, uh, eight seven eight feet and that allows a, a, a conventional vineyard tractor not a uh, orchard tractor but just in you know, the old old style vineyard tractor and the spacing between plants is uh, three to four feet. Um, so Nick, uh, if I could just jump in a little bit, um, to, just to give a little bit of a broader view, not so much vine spacing and trellising and whatnot, but um, in general, I think what Vanessa and Nick uh, are looking to do is to uh, really have all the flavor development and the, the, the character and quality of the wine happen in the vineyard, as opposed to in the winery, of course, uh, Vanessa makes wine and so she is guiding that but really it's in the, the farming and so the farming is for organic grape growers uh, yes Nick's making decisions about what to plant how to farm it uh, yields things like that in discussion with Vanessa um, but it's very much thinking about the vineyard when you're thinking about where these things these flavors are going to come from so there's being a good custodian of the land and having this project uh, last for many generations. And that's what's really driving our organic viticulture. You can farm grapes organically um, and pretty much have a, a, a pretty solid set of tools that you can use um, when, when, you're, when you're pushing the uh, ability to ripen a grape uh, towards the cold end of its ability to ripen, you're also going to be uh, increasing the disease pressure, especially for something like powdery mildew or, or botrytis. Um, and and, and uh, I, do, I do have those struggles. Um, it, the, the biggest difference not being conventional is that we don't use herbicides. Um, there just aren't effective organic herbicides. There's, there's a burn down that I'm toying with, but I digress. But um, uh, I do mechanical undervine weed management and it takes a lot longer. It takes me about 25 days and I'm the guy driving the tractor there. Um, but yeah, so what we were looking for, what I had learned was that the vine is uh, a giant weed and it just wants to grow and grow and grow. And, it, and if you give it ample water and sun, it'll put out a lot of canopy and it'll forget to put any flavor into the grapes. So you need to have some environmental constraints, not just the climate, but the soil being poor as well uh, to rein it in. Now that doesn't mean, you know, you can grow it in, uh, uh, you know, sand and with nothing in it, but uh, you know, uh, you do want well-drained soil. And so in California, it does not rain in the summer. And uh, there's a lot of mystique and woo woo about dry farming, but you know, in a climate where it doesn't rain in the summer, I have more than 20 years on some of my vines. I'm still gonna have to irrigate them at least a little bit. Um, the vines roots are getting deeper and deeper, that's true. But if the roots were to get all the way down to where there's some sort of water table and there isn't up on our vineyard, um, then, then I wouldn't have to water at all and I would have boring grapes and I'd make boring wine. So um, if you encounter 
Californians, maybe I shouldn't be too negative in my competition, but that say uh, dry farming is all the end all and be all, you're entitled to be skeptical, okay? Um, all right, well, let, let, me, let me take that uh, and, and move on to uh, a little bit about winemaking. And then I wanna get into the wines because we only have about 17 minutes to talk about three wines. So uh, Vanessa, why don't you tell us a little bit about the winemaking as we drink the wines? So um, I'm gonna stop the share. There's no reason to, to, to look at that. Um, but uh, I encourage everybody to put Chardonnay in their glass. Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, I think uh, we, we've moved on to the Pinot, but actually it's, I think it's kind of, it was so fascinating to hear uh, T and Jerry talk about their research because uh, Nick and I haven't been in the en academic en environment in a very long time. So. There's always great stuff to be learned by the new exciting research that you guys do. And I, I'm glad that, uh, that T was very careful in uh, saying that uh, it wasn't a misconception that we thought that acidity uh, preserves wine um, ageability that uh, as to not burst our winemaking bubble about uh, what we think, but the choices of winemaking do begin with the choice of where you grow grapes. And the one thing that we do see is that not only in a cooler climate that you, um, a lot more of these interesting aroma characters are, are developed um, because they have the time to, because you, they, they ripen more slowly. But I actually feel that in a cooler climate, uh, you, you preserve these characters um, better because in a warm climate, you don't get some of these characters that you have in the cooler wine regions. And that'll be really interesting to see what Jerry has to say about the development of the wine aromas. But everything that we do in the winemaking uh, scheme of things after we uh, farm them so carefully to be able to uh, create these um, aromas and flavors is to uh, preserve them, uh, to capture them, preserve them, and also to really uh, make the most of them and to put them together in a way that really shows off uh, our region. And so, you know, I think it'd be super fascinating just to study uh, the different aroma characters of just Pinot alone. I mean, in Pinot Noir, you have these, and actually in Chardonnay, which, some of you might still be on, Nick and I have actually moved on to the Pinot, but Chardonnay can be the world's most boring grape ever if you let it be. And you know, a lot of that has to do with where it's grown and also how much fruit you put on those vines. And you know, they always say that when you control the yields, um, it's very, that helps uh, preserve the fruit character, develop the fruit character, but there's a limit to that. You don't wanna have it too, too low, but you don't also, don't want it too high. And, and that balance really creates a very interesting Chardonnay from the fruit level. But then there's also very interesting things to be able to capture that and to preserve it. Like we do um, a lot of whole cluster pressing, which uh, really produces a very fine juice. And not only that, we have a, the selection of our clonal selection in, within in the vineyard has the most interesting aromas out of all the Chardonnay uh, clones that you can choose. And then we just uh, have a very slow fermentation using um, uh, indigenous yeast, which in itself adds a uh, character, not only to the nose, but a lot to the palate, to the, uh, the mouth gill. And then Another added thing in wine making is uh, the barrel character, which is one of the things that you want to put a little bit in, but you really want to make sure that it's not the dominant character. And that's part of um, one of the most important things in wine making is to, to highlight something, but then not bowl over it by putting too much new oak. And so that's kind of it in a, a nutshell for the Chardonnay, but it goes the same for the Pinot where we find very interesting clones of Pinot Noir and where it's grown, we can get a lot of interesting aromas like 
uh, floral and different type of fruits that um, have the same that you can see in, in the coastal climate. And then my job as a winemaker is to find the exact right picking date for those. I can't emphasize that enough. That has got to be her most important job is when to pick the grape. I mean, down to the hour of the day. Hour of the day. Well, <laughs> the it day. depends on the weather. <laughs> depends on the weather. If we're having a big stretch of cool, she might have a window of a few days, you know, three or four or five days. Even. But sometimes the window is very small. But to really capture the expression is, you know, my job is to figure out how to blend. We, we how to blend these different lots. So we do pick every lot separately because certain um, slopes ripen differently from other parts of the vineyard. And thank goodness for that, because otherwise we'd have to pick everything on the same day, which we don't. Um, and we vinify everything separately. And I get all these different components. And then my job is to put together the different barrels together to make a, a blend that is expressive of the site. And for me, Pay Vineyards is so exciting. They have these different um, aroma pro profiles. So what I wanted to do was not just capture the, the one personality of the vineyard, but there are different expressions within our um, vineyard. And so to be able to make a cuvee that's more, that captures the floral and the classic red fruits a little bit more, um, rather than you have another cuvee that captures more of the, the earthiness. And so this uh, wine here, the scallop shelf is, um, you know, something that I really wanted to highlight how the vineyard can really show this floral and very classic um, red fruits uh, character in the wine. And... When I mentioned fruit, floral, and earth, I think this wine is a good example. Could Jill, could you mute your, uh, your Zoom? It's creating an echo. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. What? Would you mind muting your Zoom? Oh, how do I do that? Um, so this is a good example of the, that harmony among floral, fruit, and earth aromas. Um, there's Vanessa in her winemaking really wants to capture those aromas in the bottle so that uh, when you put it in the glass and you smell it, there's a really bright floral note and uh, there's a red fruit note. Um, and then on the palate, what I'm getting that's lingering around are some more earthy notes, dried, dried pine needles, some tea, things of that nature. And so that's, that's what I'm, I was talking about, a harmony among fruit, floral and earth that's the experience we want. And not only is that going to happen throughout the bottle you drink, but hopefully over the life of the wine as it evolves and those aromas integrate. And um, I think that makes the wine more interesting, uh, engages you intellectually in a sensory way, but also hopes, hopefully deliciously. It's worth um, addressing the general question of, of, of what do you gain with aging? I'm not sure all of our audiences on the same page really understands. And uh, when a, a wine is new, um, it is very primary. That is, there are a few very strong flavors. And then with time, those strong flavors uh, become less strong and other flavors begin to appear. You get more complexity and more nuance. So that's the goal. Not every wine is going to get better with age. And of course, when will it be at its most interesting? That's a good question. And again, that. <laughs> varies with wine. That's what to find out. <laughs> varies person to person. I was actually writing aging recommendation notes for every single wine we've ever made today. That was fun. Um, and, you know, some people like more primary flavors. They like more presence, more impact. Some people, you know, they want that Chardonnay shot and dead and oxidized, and we leave those to the Brits. Uh, but, <laughs> we, you know, it really depends on, you know, your personal taste. However, I, I like to think that there's a, at least a middle ground where you give the primary flavors, which are more obvious flavors, maybe from a barrel or maybe just from fruit expression, a little time to mellow 
so that you can actually see the unique personality of that vineyard or that wine. Um, because it's not, you don't have all these things shouting at you. So when I drink a wine that's five, 10 years old, one of my wines, um, I, I start to get a feel for like, oh yeah, that's the scallop shell flavor. Instead of, oh, there's the orange rind and sandalwood and rose petal and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's just more of that's, that's scallop shelf. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's that's how I think about it. Um, so I don't want to run out of time for Syrah because it's actually my favorite red grape, although I'm not supposed to have favorites among any of my wines or varieties because that, that, that shows that I'm perhaps uh, a simpleton, but because uh, I do love all wines, but cold climate Syrah is... Uh, is where I live personally. Um, and uh, this location where we're growing Syrah is kind of kind of nuts uh, for that variety. Um, uh, Jerry was talking about Rotundin and it is a, uh, a, an aroma that you get in cold climate Syrah in particular. It stays in the skins. And I think you get it in this third wine that you're tasting. A little bit of that pepper, a little bit of white pepper, black pepper note. Um, depending on the vintage, we'll have more or less of it, depending on the clone that we grow. And for those of you who don't know much about clones or that's kind of a new concept, the way to think about it is, at least the way I think about it, is that we grow up to 15 different clones and or selections of Pinot Noir and six of Syrah and, and seven of Chardonnay, et cetera. But I think about them as different paints on your palette if you're a painter. So it's different colors. So if you have all these different colors, Vanessa can pull off high notes, middle notes, base notes, earthy, fruity, whatever, and she can put them together to create a certain profile that's that's complete. And so when we have a wine like the Le Titan that you have the Syrah in your glass, um, there are gonna be floral notes, the lavenders, maybe a little violets. You've got some of the pepper notes. You have some of the more red fruit. We don't really get a lot of blue fruit, maybe a blue, little bit of blueberry, but we tend to stay on the red fruit zone and then some earthiness and some, some of that, that earthy pepper stuff that depending on the vintage, depending how old it's been in bottle, you start to get more of that kind of lamb jus and some of those, 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 uh, those meaty bloody iron flavors that I love. Um, one of the distinct things about Syrah, this Syrah is uh, getting back to acidity uh, tea. I'm sorry to pick on you. You know way more than I do, but um, our wines, uh, stay fresh, uh, sometimes even longer than I want them to. I want them to evolve more quickly uh, in bottle. And our Syrahs in particular have quite a low pH for Syrah. Uh, and so they're quite fresh and bright. And, you know, some people I think think about Syrah and they think about, you know, big, strong, knock you around. And that's not what we're doing. We're still looking for elegance, finesse, and to go well at the table. So these wines will go really well at the table, particularly if you have, you know, fatty meats that can, you know, it, it'll cut right through that, uh, and, um, but it doesn't require it. Okay, can I get complicated here? <laughs> Since this is a science group here, I can just throw out a little bit of complexity here. Um, Syrah, as a variety, is actually uh, rather poor at retaining its acidity. So relative to other Syrahs, the Syrah that we grow in our cold climate is acidic, but relative to our other wines, it's not as acidic. Yet, everything you said about how long it evolves, how long it takes to evolve, I keep guessing too early. People say, when is it gonna be at its peak? And I'm like, well, I don't know, nine, 10, whatever years, and I'm, I'm not, it's not enough, not long enough. So there's something about this raw, and I will let the researchers tell us what, the, what that is that allows it to really age. Well, T, that's what I put in the chat. I, I asked, okay, if it's not the acidity, is it the phenols uh, that correlate with acid levels? If it's the phenols instead, like, what is it? Because there's something about higher acid wines that that is making that perception, giving me that per perception. Um, so it's not something I've talked about in the presentation, but an idea I'm working with now is that pH affects how well phenols sort of sop up that oxidized character. It's sort of like hiding oxidation. And I, I think that might be pH dependent. So, yeah. And to add to that, um, you know, pH uh, also 
really determines um, the microbiological uh, activity. And um, the lower the pH, uh, there's fewer things that can really thrive. And um, also the efficacy of, uh, you know, the SO2, which is in wine. So when you have microbes that can take over, definitely if you have fewer of them, then the reactions in the, of what ages a wine or kind of deteriorates the freshness of the fruit characters, um, that's influenced by the pH as well. So I just to be clear on that relationship, the, 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 the lower the pH, that is the higher the acid, the less SO2 is necessary. That it, it's more effective in smaller amounts. So I was gonna just uh, take a couple things out of the chat um, because we've kind of finished the formal uh, discussion of pay and the wines, um, but if you have any questions about our wines, other wines, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, somebody asked uh, if we didn't open the Syrah, should we let it go a year longer? And I say, shame on you. It's only a half bottle. Come on, William Goodson. I'm going to call you up. <laughs> no, um, but it, a year longer, you can like get it that another 10 years longer. <laughs> so, so. No, it's a half bottle. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but it'll still, I mean, it'll go quite long. And what the question, fair question is, well, what's going to be different? And uh, that's where I was getting at where some of those aromas, the more obvious flavors will calm down a bit. And maybe some secondary aromas will come on. I don't think a year is really long enough for any of the secondary aromas to start coming along. Um, Vanessa, uh, Andrew wants to know, how did you get into winemaking? Uh, I was uh, really young. <laughs> so I grew up in San Francisco and um, I'm the youngest of four uh, kids. Uh, and uh, my older sister, who's six years older than I am, she uh, studied uh, hotel and restaurant management, and she got me a job at a wine and cheese shop uh, in San Francisco. And actually, before that, we used to do help a caterer uh, together, where we would set up, um, serve the food, and uh, clean up. And I was only like 13 <laughs> or 14, and the caterer, she would just... Um, like to kick back after the the job and open you know some of the leftover bottles of wine and uh sit around and 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 drink and chat and when she offered me some as a kid i was like oh sure okay and that was when um it was in the early 80s and uh it was when uh they started putting um varieties the varietal name of the wine on the bottle. So before that, it used to be like Hardy Burgundy or um, Chablis, as they would say in Gallo. <laughs> and so uh, this, it was, I remember the wine distinctly. It was 1983 Glen Ellen. And uh, I thought, wow, how fascinating. What does Chardonnay mean? What is that? And my sister also, when she was studying a hotel and restaurant management, she had a lot of books about uh, wine and beer and wine and beer service. And one of the books she had on wine was a book um, that had these maps. And uh, I was just so fascinated that wines had different regions. Um, and when it came time to figure out uh, what to study at school, and I worked in the wine and cheese shop and I was really fascinated by the whole process of cheese making. Um, and I had to know a little bit about wine to be able to sell it, although I'm not sure how many people took my word for it as a 14 year old. And when I uh, started, when I got into Davis, I had another sister who was also three years older than I am that was studying um, to be, uh, to get into med school. She, I didn't know what to, I wanted to study, but I knew I got into Davis and she handed me a course catalog and uh, asked, she goes, well, why don't you just look through this and see if anything interests you. And when I saw that you could study um, viticulture and enology, and I saw the prerequisites, I talked my parents into it because they said, look, it's the same stuff as pre-med. If it, if it doesn't work out, I can always just go to med school, just like my sister. And they bought it, <laughs> hook, line, and sinker. And I think my dad had a feeling that this was, I was not going to go that path. I was going to be hauling hoses or something. But I think they had no idea that I would uh, end up um, being a farmer, and actually I wasn't even sure that I would be ending up a farmer, but 
that's where the path takes it. It's more exciting to be farming grapes and making the wine as well than just um, picking the grapes and making wine out of them. So there's some questions in the chat. Um, one I thought was applicable for tea. Does decanting make a difference? I think I could just say that um, it has to do with the rapid incorporation of oxygen. So a lot of compounds are going to change all at once. Right, T? Yes, yeah, yeah. mainly like sulfury, sort of eggy smelling compounds, yeah. But I, I would say secondary other aroma compounds will come up faster. Like if you take that bottle of wine and you take the cork out and it's full, and then you come back a half an hour later, not as much oxygen will have incorporated. If you pour it into a decanter, it's wide and there's a big surface area, the wine will have a lot more um, open aromas, a lot more aromas that'll be uh, ready for your nose to experience. And that's, that's the finish line of the whole process that we're doing. So um, you can overdo it. You can have it in the decanter too long. And by the time you pour that wine out, it doesn't have a lot going on at all. Uh, we call that tired. Um, but uh, I'm not sure where the controversy comes from decanting. You know, with experience, you drink the same wine and you try it in a decanter, not in a decanter, decanter for different amounts of times, you'll figure it out. It's, it's not subtle. It's pretty straightforward. People tend to decant to take wines off their sediment if they're older um, or when they're younger to uh, give them some air to get uh, the volatile aromas out. Uh, you don't want to decant an old wine too long because you might miss its moment. Um, the other thing you, is interesting you said about uh, more of the sulfury things coming out. I've had wines that are really reductive and, and stinky and uh, you decant them and let them blow out and then the wine can come out, the aromas. But oh, yeah, I, I meant to um, say that the sulfur compounds go down and the other compounds come back up. They sort of reveal themselves, yeah. Um, so somebody's asked about Coravent a couple of times. Coravent is this little tool where you can stick a needle into through a cork and uh, you push wine through the needle uh, out a little spout into a glass and essentially filling up the headspace in the bottle with a gas that's inert um, to preserve the wine that's left in the bottle so that you can take a glass out of a bottle and theoretically preserve the wine that remains. Um, and, uh, you know, just anecdotally, uh, we uh, use Coravan uh, every once in a while. Um, I've used it personally twice in my life. Um, why not just pull the cork? Uh, but uh, we have found that really it depends on how much wine's left in the bottle uh, for how long you can let uh, that wine sit um, with that increased headspace. And I think anecdotally, Nick, I think we find like within a week, as long as there's two thirds or more of, of the, the wine in the bottle, it'll, it'll be okay. You're gonna lose a lot of top end aromatics for sure but it'll be fine. Once it gets beneath yeah. half a bottle, things start to get wonky and it blows out. You know that, that um, phenomenon of, of, of letting the wine decant too long and becoming flat, that won't happen with the Corvin. It's something else where it's like the top end is just knocked off. And here's what's going on. I love if Dr. Waterhouse or T or Jerry would correct me here, but you have argon that's going in and replacing the liquid volume, there are 0% of those lovely aromatic compounds dissolved in that argon gas. And so the wine that's left needs to come into equilibrium with this new gas that's been entered into the wine. So while you're not getting oxygen actually doing some chemical changing, you're having a percent of those aromatic compounds that you want to smell in your nose actually hanging out now in that argon. So th that's, that's why it's not uh, the miracle. You're not gonna be able to drink two thirds, three quarters of the bottle and then come back five years later. No, it doesn't work that way. And I'll say Andy, the, the thing to do is um, better than the refrigerator, if you wanna just have a couple glasses is save an empty half bottle, you now all have three of them. And uh, when you open a 750, pour half of it into a 375, cork it, put it in the fridge. So that reduces the remaining headspace. Yeah, you introduce a lot of oxygen when you pour it into the half bottle, but uh, that, you know, it's better than nothing. 
So wow. um, somebody asked if we have a direct consumer business. Yeah, we sell about um, two thirds, three quarters of our wines direct to consumer. I encourage you to go to our website uh, where you can do that. Um, but that's it for the chat. Uh, I don't want to wrap up your your uh, your presentations, but I have a I have a question for Jerry. Actually, I've been thinking about this, um, Jerry. Uh, I've been thinking, what what would a grape variety that's high in TDN and high high in pyrazine? Uh, do you have a Do you have one of those grapes? Because I think that would be a really interesting interesting variety. So uh, the um... Pyrazines, yes, so they all have some amount of pyrazines. Um, so you can taste it. I mean, for some of the individuals, it goes away as they ripen, and for others, it's still really strong. And so that's the bell pepper. Um, but TDN, you can't taste um, until the wine, until it's been made into wine, and it's been mm -hmm. aging for some amount of time. Um, so the i think we can measure that for we can we can look for the precursors uh in the metabolite analysis uh, that we're doing now but um we can't taste for that but i think it would be a very interesting combination of flavors so vanessa would you want to make a wine that's like that the, the, no, the tds you guys make Riesling? the, uh, the diesel part of no. Riesling, mm -hmm. right okay yeah, yeah. yeah. um you know, I, I'm not super interested in wines that have a lot of methoxypyrazine, um, you know, just a little bit, <laughs> but that's not to me the, the most interesting characteristic of a Cabernet. But I think you put them both together and, you know, two things that are good in individual varieties may be good, but you put them together and it, they might kind of amplify <laughs> or cancel each other out i don't know but i think putting them together might be a little odd <laughs> it, it's it's a you know worthwhile thing well i mean one thing you could do is just blend the wines and see how that would actually turn out just preliminary to see what that would smell brings like. us full circle into <laughs> her making the cuvee you know we, andy was talking about having all these colors on the palette and you know we can taste these two different pinot noirs and think oh my goodness they're going to combine so well, but something happens probably chemically when you put them together and A plus B does not equal C, it equals Z or something. <laughs> well, I think it's the hour, I hate to do this, but um, this was fabulous. I did see all of you. You're welcome. Thank you all so much. Um, I just want to, um, Thank Nancy Mueller, our um, Zoom guru. So it's another another successful evening. And I also wanted to put a plug in for next month's science activity Zoom, which is um, the illustrious Elena Davidson, and she is going to talk about um, Hoover Archives. So um, I hope you will join us February 11th. Thank you all so much. It was um, great to see everyone. Absolutely and, uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank Deborah, you. Thank you. Deborah. Good organization, Deborah. great program. Cheers. Cheers. Congratulations Cheers. to you. This was a huge event. It oh, took fabulous Deborah. time and thank fantastic. Deborah, what are you doing there the day after your knee surgery? I'm having a blast. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wine. Yeah. Oh, oh gosh. gosh. Oh. Yeah. I wouldn't well, have that. That was a fantastic evening. Thank you very much. I Thank love you all. It. Thank you all for um, joining in. It was it was just great. It really was. Thank you. And thank you for your time. Thank you. And Wines to are fantastic. <laughs> Thank you to UC Davis and to the Pays. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Listen to it all over again because it's way over my head and I was a chemist <laughs> a few years ago. Cheers. 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 Everybody. Look forward Cheers. to our next one. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Have a great everybody. evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye. Bye.
Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you all. Nick, everyone. Thank so you. So much fun. Boy, Very boy. fun. Oh, fun. It's like the Walton. Okay, bye, everybody. Come <laughs> on. Good night, Jim Bob. Hi, <laughs> yeah. Mary Ellen. Oh, great, guys. It it is awesome. It. Awesome. G yeah. and Jerry, you are fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good. And Janet, good night. <laughs> Who's your daughter? Hi. Hi. I have my whole family here. Oh, I'd like to see how this is done. Awesome. <laughs> How old is your daughter? My daughter is actually on the line, Monica Berry. She's uh, she is legal drinking age. Oh my God! She just okay. All right, <laughs> got it. <laughs> it's my eyes. <laughs> oh, so much fun! What a great, what a great, great, great evening! Wasn't that awesome, Janet? It was wonderful. Thank oh. you, thank you guys oh. for all you did. Together. Oh, thank you, Janet. Thank you, Nancy. No, I don't need any thanks. I just try to figure it out. I'm lucky most well, of the I time. Think you do a great job. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank well, you, Nancy. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, Eli, how are you we'll doing? Person soon. <laughs> Hi, Janet. Hi. <laughs> oh, goodness. Hi, Elaine. I have my burgundy expert next to me. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Nice to <laughs> this is a nature. She knows everything about burgundies. And you let me know if you're interested, and I'll give you her information. <laughs> Hi, Lee. Back. How are you? <laughs> hey, Lee Borgard, where'd you go? <laughs> oh, goodness. I'm Meryl Randall. Oh my gosh. Oh. These are all old friends, you guys. So Janet, you just have to <laughs> Thank you. Thank well, you we're all we're going to dinner now. Take care. Yeah. Great. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Let's go. Um, okay. End meeting for all.